Hi, I'm Sonja Englert. Welcome to this airplane design tutorial about flight control system bearings. Bearings are not only used in control surface hinges, but also at the bell cranks and rods inside the airplane structure. Once installed, they are often ignored until something does not feel right. I am providing a summary of the types of bearings used in control systems, their pros and cons, and will add some general remarks about flight control system design and about maintenance. What matters most to the pilot is how the controls feel in flight. It feels nice if they move easily with low force, friction or play, regardless of the speed or load. That should be the goal for the designer, especially for the control stick or yoke. Low forces are of secondary importance for rudder and flaps. This airplane is a good example on how it should be. The T6 is one of those with the nicest feel of the controls that I have flown, even though it is heavy and fast. Air loads increase with speed, and so the load and pressure on the hinges is higher the faster you fly. This means you need no more force to move the stick in cruise than in slow flight. Aerodynamic balance horns can reduce the control surface hinge moments, but not the pressure on the hinges. If there is a lot of friction in the system, to overcome it, the pilot must apply extra force to move the controls. Friction also prevents the controls from returning exactly to their neutral or trim position. If a control system has a lot of play, it feels sloppy to the pilot. And in the worst cases, this increases the workload, makes the airplane more difficult to fly and could lead to flutter. The simplest hinge consists of just a bolt in a bracket. It is cheap and lightweight, so you can find something like this on simple slow airplanes, but it has its disadvantages. It is not a very durable solution and it needs to be cleaned and greased frequently to keep the parts moving. Both the bolt and the bracket should be made from steel to have adequate strength. With the thin bracket in this example, it can be expected to wear through the bolt eventually and wear out the holes in the sheet metal, leading to a lot of play. Hopefully the parts will be replaced before they look like this. Of course there should not be threads in the area of the bracket. The grip of the bolt must be long enough so that the thread is outside of the bracket or the bearing strength will be much reduced. This picture shows three examples of simple hinges. Hinge A has the highest bearing stress and will therefore wear faster and have more friction than the others. The wider the bracket material and the larger the bolt diameter is, the lower is the bearing stress for the same load. Hinge B has a lower bearing stress, but the bolt shear stress is higher in single shear than in double shear as in hinge C. Hinge C has the lowest stresses and best durability. This type of hinge requires a castle nut with a cotter pin because the nut, nut cannot be tightened. Lock nuts must not be used on joints that can rotate because this can cause the nut to come off. Hinges can have loads in X, Y and Z direction so they have to be designed accordingly. For control surfaces on the wing the highest loads are usually the vertical loads FZ, but you must not neglect the spanwise loads FY. The spanwise loads for ailerons, for example, are generated during yawing maneuvers, especially spins. If the hinge brackets are long and thin, they will bend sideways, and if the gap between the control surface and the fixed part of the wing is too small, the aileron will jam. A control surface like A with multiple hinges must have at least one hinge designed to take spanwise loads, which means it must be secured with a nut. The other hinges may or may not have nuts, depending on the design, like B. Obviously, the hinge line has to be straight for the control surface to rotate freely. This must be assured during the build process. But in flight, the wings bend under load and the hinge line becomes an arc. Is this a problem? If the wings are long and flexible, like they are on gliders, the answer is yes. The solution is to divide the ailerons into shorter sections, each with its own actuation. For my motor glider Caro 1, I divided the ailerons into two sections per side. The longer outboard aileron is almost 7 feet long, 
with a mean cord of 4.43 inches. It has 5 hinges to keep the bending load on the aileron low. The aileron flexes with the wing, but I have not noticed any increase of aileron forces due to the slightly curved hinge line during normal operations. It is even less of an issue for airplanes with their shorter and stiffer wings, so there is little to worry about. A different kind of simple hinge are piano hinges. Here the bearing stress is lowest because the brackets are very wide. In some cases the hinge extends over the full span of the control surface. This allows the hinge pin to have a very small diameter and the bracket material to be very thin because the loads are well spread out. For airplanes, aluminum is typically used as the bracket material and the pins are steel. The challenge here is to keep the hinge pin from falling out. Bending the ends is the most secure way, but that means it cannot be removed without cutting. The other challenge is lubricating the hinge and keeping it clean and free from dust. The latter is just about impossible, so it will wear eventually and when the plate increases or the wall thickness of the bracket material gets too thin, the hinge will have to be replaced. Another special case of a simple bearing is used with large diameter pivots like steel tubing. This works because the bearing stress is really low due to the large diameter and wide clamp. The advantage is that the bearings can be bolted together from two pieces, which is often used on parts that have fittings welded on both ends and it is not possible to slide a bearing on. A low friction plastic material can be used as the bearing block or a split sleeve as an insert in a metal block. A better solution than the simple bolt and bracket hinge is one that uses a bushing. This design also needs to be frequently cleaned and lubricated to keep friction and wear low. Lock nuts can be used in version A where the bushing is slightly longer than the width of the bracket so that it can be tightened. Here the bushing and bolt are locked together and the hinge rotates on the bushing. Version B has a loose fit with a short bushing that requires a castle nut and cotter pin. If a loose fit is used, the bracket with the bushing can rotate on the bolt or the bushing can rotate in the bracket. The bushing should be of a softer material like brass, bronze or oil light so that the friction is reduced even with inadequate lubrication and there is no potential for locking up. Bushings can also be pressed in, but that makes them more difficult to replace when they are worn. A hinge with a bushing has the highest load capability, but friction increases with load. It is best used in flap and rudder systems where the friction is less of a factor. Low profile hinges are possible when the width of the brackets can be increased. In this example, the bolt is kept from sliding out of the steel bracket with a roll pin and the control surface is easy to install or remove because only one of the hinges requires a nut, the others just slide on. Avoid the use of moving parts of the same material. Steel on steel is worst, aluminum on aluminum is not good either. If the lubrication is gone, the parts can gel and in the worst case lock up. The worst material is stainless steel. I had that problem once while ground testing a new airplane design. There was a stainless steel rod sliding in a tight fit through a stainless steel bushing. After a few movements, the parts had practically welded themselves together and had to be disassembled with a hammer. Always combine a harder material, which should be the bolt, with a softer material like bronze. Aluminum should be avoided except in piano hinges or in machined brackets with bushings. Ball bearings provide the smoothest, lowest drag movement without the potential for play, so they are a great choice for ailerons and elevators. Sealed bearings are best because the grease stays in and the dust out. This is a maintenance-free solution for a long time and has very low wear. <coughs> the upfront cost is fairly high but that is more than saved in time and hassle over the life of the airplane compared to bushings or open bearings. Ball bearings are larger in diameter than bushings. This needs to be considered during the design of the hinge bracket. Needle bearings are smaller in diameter, but they are open. 
Open bearings collect dust and grit and soon the friction increases. Ball bearings have lower load ratings than bushings. Small diameter ball bearings can only handle low loads. The load rating increases with the diameter. If there is not enough room for larger diameter bearings, increase the number of hinges. For higher loads and low friction, needle bearings are an alternative to ball bearings because the forces are transferred over a line and not just a point. Here the bolt itself becomes the inner bearing surface, so use bolts with a high yield strength or a hardened bushing for better durability. The bearing types discussed so far all have in common that they can ro only rotate around a fixed axis. Only ball bearings may allow a small misalignment angle of a few degrees. In other areas in the control system, where the direction of the motion is changed by bell cranks, the joints or hinges require a larger misalignment angle. There you need to use self-aligning or spherical bearings or rod ends. Self-aligning ball bearings are open due to the function they provide. If packed with grease and protected with felt washers on both sides, dust can be kept out for a while. Rod ends have a steel housing and a lining of a low friction material, which allows the ball to swivel freely. New rod ends can vary from quite tight and stiff to loose and having some play. The stiff ones may loosen up over time, but until then they can add quite a bit of friction to the control system. The housing may be machined or cast, which affects the load rating. The ball part of a rod end needs to be lubricated regularly to keep the friction low. If a ball bearing or rod end is used, keep in mind that side loads can cause the bearing to disintegrate. This is no big problem if there are brackets on both sides as in example B. To keep this from becoming a catastrophic failure in a single shear installation, shown here as A, use a large diameter washer on the open side to keep the parts together. I once had such a failure on an aileron of a prototype airplane where the single shear hinges had bearings without retaining washers. One of the two hinge bearings failed and the bolt was suddenly sitting in a much larger hole of the cage, which caused the aileron to move in unexpected ways. I was lucky and retained enough roll control, control to land safely without losing the aileron. Since then I am a fan of control surfaces with more than two hinges for redundancy. When you design the hinges and select the bearings, you need to know what the loads on them are. The simplest way to estimate those is to divide the total air load of the control surfaces by the number of hinges. The result is only about right if there are two hinges. If there is a third hinge in the middle, the load there will be higher than at the end hinges. A rough estimate is that the end hinges have about 25% of the total load and the center hinge gets 50%. The load on the actuation hinge will again be higher. The control surface air loads calculated per the usual procedures do not take all the factors into account that can cause a hinge to fail. Therefore the ultimate load is increased by factors which depend on the design of the hinge. The regulations 14 CFR 23 specify the use of these factors, which take into account brief overloads from vibration lack of lubrication and wear over the life of the hinge and other joints in the control system. Here are the applicable paragraphs. The formula then looks like this. Control surface hinge safety factor to calculate the ultimate load is the limit load times factor K1 times factor K2. No type of bearing can be totally ignored long term. Grease and oil dry up and parts corrode. They should be inspected annually and if the friction in the system increases, the cause should be investigated. It is usually fixed easily with the proper lubrication.